Hi, I'm Eric Danielson. I'm the uh, Arts and Entertainment Editor here at The Tribune, and uh, with me is James Owen, our film critic. Uh, this week in The Trib, James's weekly film review, he looks at Ready Player One, which is the new uh, Steven Spielberg adaptation of Ernest Cline's popular science fiction novel. And so I thought it'd just be kind of a, a good time maybe to talk a little bit about kind of that, you know, very fraught uh, relationship from going from the page to the screen. Sometimes that works really well, uh, other times it clearly doesn't. And so I was just kind of curious to talk for a few minutes, James, about maybe what are some of your favorite film adaptations, uh, you know, films that you feel like maybe do the book justice or bring out something new uh, that, that you know, we wouldn't otherwise see? Well, you know, it's always tough when you're talking about a film adaptation of a book because you're you're literally taking something that is a very detailed, very extensive experience like a book and trying to m mold it down to two or three hours sure. at the most. Yeah. And I tell you, I think one of the most instructive novels to screen is Adaptation. Mm, uh, the book about uh, that's based on the book uh, White Orchard by uh, Susan Orlean. She's a New Yorker writer who wrote about this guy who raises orchids and how that is not necessarily a very exciting idea for a movie, but basically the film takes it from a screenwriter trying to adapt yeah. that book into a movie, and then that kind of becomes the movie itself. And, and, and to the extent that it's very funny, it's very sharp, it's very meta, it's really well done. It came out about 15, 16 years ago as far as Nicolas Cage, Tilda Swinton, Meryl Streep. Um, there's a lot of people in there directed by Spike Jones. A lot of people know him from a lot of his offbeat films that he's directed. Yeah. Uh, I think that's one of those films that kind of shows you how hard it is to adapt something. That, yeah, for sure. And, and I think it's also really entertaining on its own right. Yeah. Um, you know, I think when you look at others, when you look at other films, I man, a, a novelization I really like, or not a novelization, but a film that I think really does the book justice is the right stuff. Philip okay. Kaufman yeah. directed this movie about the uh, kind of the early origins of the uh, space program with NASA. That is a very, that's a very epic, bombastic, masculine book, and you have these great actors in there like Sam Shepard. Like Scott Glenn, Fred Willard, Philip Kaufman directed it. I, I don't really think he's done anything better than that. And that's a pretty old movie. That's a thirty-five-year-old movie yeah, now. Yeah. Yeah. But it is uh, it is really good and really shows like how a film can capture the spirit of a book. Yeah. Just sure. off the top of my head. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. I, I was trying to think of a couple too. You know, there's a lot yeah. of films that I have seen, but I haven't read the book. So I was thinking of like, well, Fight Club. I, I've still never read the, the oh. Chuck Palahniuk book. You know, I've never read. Uh, the, the No Country for Old Men book, but I was, I was thinking about a couple that I've, I've seen and, and read. Right. So one, I mean, a classic to me is uh, To Kill a Mockingbird. Is oh, sure, yeah, you know, absolutely. Like doing Harper Lee. Right. Um, I thought about The Outsiders, which is another probably 35-year-old movie, but... Um, it's getting up there, yeah. 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 <laughs> Coppola, directing Nancy yeah. Hinton's book and, and a pretty amazing cast for that time. Not all these guys were a big deal yet, but Patrick Swayze, Tom Cruise, sure. Rob Lowe, Milo Estevez. And then one that's still kind of old, but re more recent. Um, I really love the treatment that Stephen Frears did of High Fidelity, oh. the Nick Hornby novel. Um, does a really good job of transferring yeah. British snobby record culture to American snobby that record is, culture. Oh my gosh, it's such a great movie, and it also makes me think a lot about about a boy. Yeah, uh, another uh, which is another Nick Hornby adaptation. Which I mean, one you know keeps the British aspect of it. You think about the fact that it had this massive blow to it, where Courtney Love wouldn't give the rights over to Nirvana songs, mm. which was such an important part of the book. That's right, I forgot about And so they were able, because I mean, if you look at the title about a boy, it's like a reference to a Nirvana song. Right, right. And so the fact that they were able to do that and still capture the spirit of it is really good. But High Fidelity, yeah, that's a movie that kind of uses that uh, narrator that breaks the fourth wall, right. talks directly to the audience, and sometimes that really helps, you know, you know, where you're kind of looking at that character from a per first-person perspective. Right. And they're still able to connect with you directly as an audience member, just like they would a reader. I think yeah. with High Fidelity, yeah, gosh, it's a great movie. And that's a good, yeah, and of course, John Cusack being that, that narrator. And that, I yeah. think, sidesteps one of the problems, right, that we usually see with adaptations, which is trying to get through all that exposition. And you feel yeah. like people either skip over things or they're putting so much in the mouths of a character that it just kind of gets a little bit ridiculous. And that maybe that kind of narrator perspective right. kind of deals with that a little bit. And I think it really takes for someone to be successful at adapting a movie, and I think this is why Spielberg's been so good at it. And he directed this Ready Player One, which isn't a great movie, but I think probably is a better film than a lot of other directors could have done. Sure. He is so visual, and he is able to tell so much of his story through his camera work and through his sets that, you know, a lot of those details where you have to spend your time in a book talking about this is how this room looked and this yeah. is how this person thought. 
Yeah. And he's able to do that visually in a way that when you look at his films that he's adapted from books, which is really a lot more extensive than I thought of, than when I started looking at this, Jaws, mm. Jurassic Park, yeah. uh, The Color Purple, uh, Schindler's List, um, he's Lincoln. Yeah. Uh, he, he's made a lot of films that are based on you know, really popular books, books that a lot of people didn't really know if they could pull off as a film. I mean, Jaws should have been impossible to pull yeah. off just because of trying to have that animatronic shark out there. Like, he was able to do so much with his camera work, do so much with the insinuation of, of some of the visual styles there that he, it, he really can do a lot of that justice just because he does think with such a, such a, you know, such a, such a way with his eyes. Yeah, for sure. Well, I, I was thinking about, and I'm going to give you time to think by sharing a couple of my choices, but I was trying to think about films that I have, or would like to see, books that I've read that I would love to see put on the big screen. The two that I thought of are never going to happen, probably because they're not <laughs> well-known enough books, but I would still love to see it because I think the storytelling is so rich. Um, one I just read this last year is uh, Walker Percy's Love in the Ruins mm -hmm. from the 70s. Would hit totally right on that kind of dystopian, uh, you know, thing that's so so the rage these days. But it does it in a different way, where it's kind of like this modern day mm -hmm. kind of burned out southern town. So I feel like oh, kind okay. of like Southern Gothic meets dystopia. And then the other one is this great novel by Tom Williams, um, short novel called Don't Start Me Talking. That's about these two, a, a young blues man and an old blues man. Uh, you know, crossing the country playing music together. Mm. To say much else about the plot would kind of ruin the plot, but I would really love, I already <laughs> cast this in my mind, I, I would love uh, a Denzel Washington, Daniel Kaluuya pairing oh. as these two bluesmen yeah. crossing the country. Kind of a kind of a road movie, but also kind of a uh, satire at the same time. So something like that I would love to see, but I have no power to make these things happen, so they, they probably won't. I'd like to just see those two in a movie. Yeah, that, that would sounds be really cool. Yeah, I, I, hopefully <laughs> someone will think to do that. Uh, yeah. If I thought of it, someone should have thought of it already. But um, any any books that you particularly love that you're like, hey, either there's no good adaptations of books, right. or there just hasn't been one attempted. Well, I look at a great modern writer who is from Missouri named Jonathan Franzen, who did um, the Corrections, did Freedom, did Purity. His films, are, I mean, his books, pardon me, are really accessible, and they're really funny. I mean, they're dark, and they're very layered, but it seems to me that... They talk a lot about dysfunction, and they talk a lot about you know these kind of like funny looks at, at you know culture and everything else. And they seem like they'd be pretty ideal, mm. if not just for a um, you know for a film, but also just for a cable yeah. series. But yeah. they've never been made. And I know that uh, Showtime was looking at doing an adaptation of Purity, which is his last book. Daniel Craig was going to kind of play the uh, Julian Assange type character okay. in that, uh, but. I don't know what's happened with it, and I just think he seems like a guy who has a little bit of a mainstream appeal. I mean, his books are great. I mean, I mean The Corrections is one of my favorite mm. books of the past I mean, 30, 40 years, yeah. and I just don't understand why they haven't been able to get any traction on that. Yeah. It's too bad. That's weird. I wonder if there's anything that contractually with him specifically that he maybe he doesn't wants want more control or I don't know, yeah. Yeah, maybe he doesn't want to see uh, that stuff turn into a yeah. film. He was really, he was the guy who rejected Oprah's book club. Okay. So he might be, he just might have a thing against yeah, that. Yeah, I don't know. I don't do that. Yeah, that's really interesting. You yeah. never know with some of that stuff. Right. So, huh, okay. Well, you know, um, if you have any favorite film adaptations, uh, feel free to comment um, on this video. We'd love to hear about that or any that you think are really terrible. That's always kind of fun, too. And uh, be sure to read James's review this week of Ready Player One, which I, I think if I, if I had to sum it up, you said it looks great kind of gets in its own way a lot in yeah. terms of the point it's trying to make. He, he's obviously, Spielberg is trying to obviously go back to this period in the 80s where he's making more straightforward action films, which I'm not saying that to denigrate his action films from the 80s because they're some of the best films you'll ever watch. Sure. Raiders of the Lost Ark will probably always be in my top five. Mm. But he has evolved and matured a lot as a filmmaker since then. I think when you look at his post Schindler's List films, yeah. they are more mature, they are darker, they are trying to make some point about history, or our, our present condition in this country, and he's been able to do a lot of really interesting things with that. Uh, you look at Minority Report and mm -hmm. Artificial Intelligence, which is a Kubrick, uh, which is a, a film that Stanley Kubrick had developed, right. but Spielberg kind of picked up the torch on after Kubrick passed away. He um, he's able to do those things, but with this, he had this kind of deeper, more resonant message. But he was just more interested in showing off like his kind of toys that he was able yeah. to do visually, which. I thought it was a real missed opportunity because I think looking at the addictive nature of virtual reality is something interesting. Yeah. You know, I mean, I'm sure most people will read this column or watch this video on their phone 
or they'll sure, watch it sure. through social media, and yeah. that's there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Everybody. <laughs> but what I, what I'm saying is, I think there's something interesting to be said about that, and he just he, he kind of mentions it in parts, but then it says, mm. like, "Oh, hey, more cool stuff." Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you can read more of James's thoughts on Ready Player One, and again, share any of your uh, favorite, least favorite adaptations with us at ColumbiaTribune.com. Thanks for watching.